it, uh, similar to the experience of what it will uh, environment it will see during the launch phase because the ascent is uh, a, a crucial mission phase and the satellite's got to survive that in order to perform the mission. And probably one of the toughest parts for it. Thank you so much, Guy. And now for the first few minutes after liftoff, we'll be watching the action from Baikonur in real time as the ILS Proton travels easterly downrange. However, our viewers are going to notice some time lags between the actual flight and the display of those events and in the commentary. The reason behind this delay is that an ILS Proton, as it follows its pre-programmed flight path, it will pass out of range of the Baikonur receiving stations. At this point, signals are received by stations downrange and transmitted back to Baikonur. Baikonur. This may cause short delays. And now Russ Pritula, ILS program director, will take us through the final pre-launch stages and through liftoff. Russ? Today's launch of the SES-3 satellite on an ILS Proton has resulted in an accumulation of a lot of hard work and long hours. And everyone on the launch team was eagerly awaiting the liftoff. Teams are in their places in the launch bunker, control rooms, ground stations, and communication centers. And the final go for launch polling we mentioned earlier is being completed. In addition to those at the launch site, a lot of hard work to get the project at this stage being done by those watching us live. And we're just seconds away here. We're in the final countdown. We've got just a few seconds left here. Three, two, one, and there you have it. We have ignition start. We have liftoff of an ILS proton rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan with the SCS-3 satellite on board. At about 10 seconds after liftoff, the rocket does a roll maneuver and will soon experience maximum dynamic pressure, or Max-Q. Max-Q is the maximum aerodynamic load on the vehicle. It corresponds to about Mach 1.6 and occurs at 1 minute, 2 seconds after liftoff. We are 40 seconds into the flight and everything seems to be proceeding nominally as the vehicle heads in an easterly direction with a flight azimuth of about 61.3 degrees. There's some partly cloudy conditions tonight, so we have a uh, limited view of the vehicle tracking downrange. Still discernible, but uh, not as clear as we sometimes have. Looks a little bit better right now. And uh, we have just gone through the period of maximum dynamic pressure. One minute and 20 seconds in the flight. Still enjoying, enjoying a pretty good view as it heads down range from the Cosmodrome. all goes well, we'll be able to observe at least the first staging event this evening. Just a little bit away from sunrise there in Baikonur, that's why it was a rather dark exit from the launch pad. We are coming up on the first stage's separation from the second stage that is set to occur at two minutes into the flight. And just now hitting the two minute mark, so we're standing by for confirmation from the telemetry center in Baikonur. You were mentioning all the people at the launch site. People have put so much work into this, and a lot of hard work has also been done by those watching us live right now, which include ILS headquarters in Reston, Virginia, SES in Luxembourg, and SES World Skies in Princeton, New Jersey, and at Orbital Sciences in Dulles, Virginia. So, Guy, you have a lot of colleagues as well who are watching this put a lot of work into it. Yes, I'm sure there's people in the uh, Mission Control Center and also in our viewing area. Russ, do we have some confirmations? Yes, we have confirmation that the first and second stages have separated. You saw a visual confirmation. We'd like to actually get the telemetry data, and that's what we have now. And I can tell you that the uh, second stage engines actually ignite while still attached to the first stage. And the exhaust from those engines escapes through the open grid work between the stages. Three minutes, just over three minutes into the flight. It looks like we have a signal of a good ignition on all four second stage engines. They will burn for a total of about three minutes and 26 seconds.
We're now three minutes and 40 seconds into the flight. The next key mission milestone will be stage two, three separation at L plus five minutes and 26 seconds. 24 seconds later, the payload fairing will jettison. Thank you, Russ. The SCS-3 satellite is the third satellite in SES's multi-satellite procurement with Orbital Sciences. Let's learn more about Orbital Sciences Corporation and the SES-3 satellite. Star satellites from Orbital Sciences Corporation are the right-sized answer for small to medium geocommunications missions. That's why star satellites are the small geos of choice for leading global satellite operators as well as regional communications providers. Star satellites are advanced 3,000 kilogram class spacecraft ideally suited for a variety of FSS, BSS, DTH, and MSS applications. The baseline STAR design provides up to 5 kilowatts of payload power and supports a variety of antenna configurations. And with the new higher power STAR 2.7 design, payload power of up to 7.5 kilowatts is available. Both designs support a wide variety of payload options, including C, KU, KA, L, and S bands. STAR satellites are based on a simple, modular, and robust design using flight-proven components and subsystems. Comprehensive pre-flight testing and simple, reliable systems ensure robust service over their 15-year mission life. Star satellites offer significant economic value to customers as well. The Star Bus provides more payload power for each kilogram of launch mass than any satellite in its class. Additionally, STAR's low launch mass results in lower launch costs and a broad range of launch vehicle options. And with one of the industry's best delivery records, customers can depend on Orbital to provide reliable, on-schedule performance. Orbital STAR satellites are backed by total end-to-end -to -end support for the life of the system. Services offered include procurement of launch services, complete ground systems, telemetry and command software systems, technical training, and full-time anomaly resolution support. When you add it all up, Orbital Star satellites provide the flexibility, the affordability, and the reliability that the world's leading satellite communication service providers demand. Orbital, innovation you can count on. Well, during that last video, we fortunately did receive the confirmation of the second and third stage separation, as well as the payload fairing jettison. The payload fairing jettison occurs at a velocity of about 4,600 meters per second at an altitude of 137 kilometers. Our next major milestone happens in about four minutes. That will be the separation of the proton's third stage from the Breeze M upper stage. The SES-3 mission team for this ILS Proton launch is made up of representatives from ILS, its customer SES, Krunichev Space and Research Center, and Orbital Sciences Corporation. Here is a message from John Palme, ILS Deputy Vice President for Mission Assurance. Well, it's a beautiful day to put a vehicle on the launch pad. Of course, uh, any day that you put a vehicle on the launch pad is a good day. Uh, my name is John Palme. I'm the Deputy Vice President for International Launch Services for Mission Assurance, as well as the uh, Program Director for the OS2 SES3 mission. I'd like to recognize uh, the true Program Director for this mission, Mr. Ben Muniz. Ben was not able to join us um, on the campaign, um, but he's just spent the last two years tirelessly uh, making sure that the uh, interfaces uh, were correct and uh, that we were ready to go for the launch campaign. Uh, ben, we're, our thoughts are with you and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you soon when we get home in a few weeks. Uh, I also want to recognize some of the other International Launch Services people that uh, were here to contribute to the campaign. Mr. Mylon Wiley, Ms. Uh, Denise Stork, uh, Mr. Mike Hunter, uh, Mr. Pre Cruz, Mr. Kevin Sloan, Mr. Mohammed Ibrahim, Mr. Matt Harris. All of them have spent time here at the Cosmodrome making sure that uh, this campaign ran as smoothly as it did. Uh, I'd also like to thank the, uh, the OS2, um, the SES uh, customer, and the, uh, the Orbital Sciences team. Uh, they made a, uh, a campaign uh, a pleasure. 
And uh, lastly, I'd like to thank my, my family, my wife, Stacy, uh, my sons, Jeremy and Casey. Uh, we're praying for you, and um, I'll be seeing you soon. And lastly, uh, we always like to go out saying uh, go, and this mission is a little bit special since we were, uh, we're going to add the additional spacecraft, COSAT-2. So let me just close out by saying go Proton, go Breeze-M, go COSAT-2, go SES-3. And now let's hear a translated interview with Krunichev Program Director Pavel Pasagov about the SES-3 mission. SS-3 spacecraft, manufactured by the Orbital Sciences Corporation, provides direct-to-home TV broadcasting services to end-users in the continental part of the United States. SS-3 is the second spacecraft of this series, launched by Krunichev for its uh, SES customer. In April last year, Proton-M successfully inserted into orbit SS-1 spacecraft. The upcoming launch is especially significant for because this is our first dual commercial launch under the contract with ILS. I would like to thank ILS Orbital, SES and other participants in this campaign and wish them all good luck. On a personal note, Pavel Pasegov is a very good friend and colleague of mine and I can tell you that today just happens to be his birthday. So we wish a very special happy birthday to Pavel and what better way to celebrate than with a beautiful launch. No kidding, that's quite a gift for us. And we are coming up on stage three separation from the Breeze M. The satellites, together with the adapter, separation system, and Breeze M, are called the orbital unit. At the moment of separation, the orbital unit will be traveling at about 7,300 meters per second, or more than 16,000 miles per hour. About two minutes after that, the Breeze M will ignite for its first burn. That burn will last about four and a half minutes. About three minutes after the end of that main engine cutoff, or MECO, the vehicle is scheduled to go out of range of our ground tracking stations. We will lose communications for a little over an hour. So Russ, what can you tell us about the current status of the mission right now? Well, the confirmations are coming in very well today. Uh, while we were away there, we have confirmation of third stage shutdown, as well as the confirmation of the separation of stage three from Breeze M, the, upper, the orbital unit those events occurring on time and with nominal conditions. All right. Well, the Proton rocket is able to lift very heavy payloads into orbit. Let's take a moment to learn more about the development of the Proton. The Proton launch vehicle is the backbone of the Russian space industry with a long and significant history. Here are some quick facts. The Proton is the largest and most powerful Russian launch vehicle in operation. It has been launched more than 350 times since the mid-1960s. Krunichev Research and Production Space Center, the majority owner of ILS, is one of the pillars of the Russian aerospace industry and manufactures both the Proton rocket and the Breeze-M upper stage. While the first Proton mission was in July of 1965, the first commercial Proton launch took place almost 30 years later in April of 1996. The UR-500 vehicle's first three payloads were spacecraft called Proton-1, 2, and 3, and subsequently, the launcher was named after its original payload. Krunichev manages federal launch missions while ILS offers the Proton for commercial satellite launches. There are about seven to eight commercial missions a year and three to five federal missions, launching at a rate of about one per month. And now we have a blog entry written by a part of the ILS launch team, and it reads, In addition, as part of ILS's effort to provide customers a more flexible launch manifest with a second spacecraft processing facility, an additional hotel has been completely renovated and refurbished to permit the concurrent housing of a second campaign team. Last night, ILS and SES had the opportunity to tour the completed hotel named Cosmos with representatives from Krunichev. The group was able to tour the entire hotel, which includes a dining hall, TV family room, a sauna, a plunge pool, relaxation room for the sauna and plunge pool, laundry room, and an exercise room. Tour participants were quite impressed and were able to express their appreciation to Krunichev for their hard work during construction the past year and a half. All right, the uh, launch, the mission is continuing very 